So, I'd like to spend just two minutes on putting into perspective for last. How many of you were also here last time? Yeah. Um, so last time we have Katrin Andersen from the company called Canvas Dropper and collaborate, giving a talk about how they came to product market fit. And I think if I should wrap down, you know, also what she said, it was really about, well, do a lot of things in the beginning to try to find out, can we, do we actually serve a real need? But the main thing here is, you know, all the things that we initially think are wrong. So if you took her talks about product, market, pricing, segments, whatever, they basically changed it all. And I think the most important thing she said was, until you reach that point of product market fit, you know, you shouldn't actually be focusing on growth. Anyone remember what she, no, never says that. <laughs> what should we do? You should focus on retention, right? Especially in the market like hers, of course it's different from from company to company. But it's really interesting. This slide is actually one I stole from her. This is basically her, her overview about the canvas dropper slash collaborate life from when they started in July 2011, where they, hang, where they gave away these key rings in Asia to the exit. And she was very honest. She basically said everything we did here didn't work. But finally, at this point in time, they came into an accelerator that actually guided them to focusing on this retention and tried to learn what worked and what doesn't work. And she said there was actually a specific date or week where they nailed it. And from that point in time until they actually uh, sold the company only took a few months. I think the learning for all of us is here that it's not fun being here. I know that from several of the companies I'm in. But we just have to acknowledge that is the reality for most of us, that this process of finding a product that actually solves a real need, not, o not only in our head, takes a lot of time. Then also we had Spaces in, who was, gave a very honest presentation about their company and you know, their problems. And I think it was very interesting that they had some locations already in Copenhagen and Aarhus. They had a few, or some paying members, but they were also very honest about they didn't know what to do. And I think one of the things I remember were that they talked about where they should expand to new cities. And again, I see this from the outside, so I'm not expert in the case, but if you combine that with that for Katrine, I would say it would be very, very dangerous to go into new cities because have they really found the market, product market fit yet? I don't think they're there yet. I think if I were their advisor or I were their investor, I would say, slow down, let's try to solve this first. Berlin is not going anywhere, anywhere. London is not going anywhere. Let's try to see if actually we can build a small business where we can solve that need here. So how does that fit into the, today's talk? I think it actually fits quite well because product market fit is about hitting the numbers finding out actually we can do it in real life. It's not about that customers just think they're interested in a product. No, we can actually build a business around it. And how do you do that? You do that by measuring the progress to find out are we on the right track. Um, and that's why I think it's great we have two here. We have Jakob, which come from, how many of you know Templar already? So our categorize a sort of a late state startup to raise what seventeen million dollar. I guess when you re raise seventeen million dollar, you are onto something, right? And then we have Pinto, which is a much younger company. I'm actually an investor in the company, so I'm not. I'm a little bit biased. Fantastic company. You should all use it. Um, but but I think some of the problems can be that if you only look at late stage startups you are not looking what we should actually do. Because when I say we, I think most of you are in early stage startups. So I think this combination of Jakob's broader perspective, also because Jakob was, has been on the other side as an investor, now a CFO in Templify, together with the, uh, a younger startup like Pento, gives a good perspective on this case. That's at least my hope. So could you give me the other uh, the under, uh, slides? So, 
how do you, yeah, one second. Hmm, I don't, I'm just gonna say so about freestyle. Can I then, I'm not, okay, yeah. So KPIs and metrics. My point for the next 10 minutes, what I would like to focus on is actually to put into perspective of the last system and also on, go a little bit in depth on the different stages in a startup. And basically what I see as a patient angle. And to avoid repeating what Jonas and Jakob will say, my will be very superficial. So how many of you were here when we have Toangelo from Oroyoyo, right? So Toa, he is that person I know that best symbolized lean startup. He just not, he just not only talk about it, he's actually doing it. And before he came into Auto Yo Yo, he was involved in a number of other startups, which I know. And it's so classic to see that then Tor met the founders and they had some assumptions. Then Tor just said, how can we test that? And that is anything from he calling the customers to whatever. At some point in time, he took a train to Jutland to test some kind of software. You know, really, really hands on. And this picture actually was Tor's favorite analogy saying, okay, I have the assumption that people eat better coffee here. How can I test that assumption? You know, give me a box, cut a hole, and I start serving coffee here, right? So what TOAS focuses on really in day one, how can we test these assumptions? And of course, when you talk about build, uh, measure, learn, that fits perfectly what we're talking about today, because that is about how do we measure stuff. And, and last time we, we had the talk about um, product market fit, and, and try to uh, make it a little bit more concrete. And that was also clear that the moment you do that, you also talk about, yeah, but show me the numbers, right? So you talk about, you reach that point, and we quickly come into what's a lifetime value, what's a customer acquisition cost, et cetera. So that's why we deliberately put this session after the prior two. What I also think is important that we remember when we talk about KPIs and metrics is that it both has an internal and external perspective. So this is uh, from one of my other companies, Capdisk. I think it's actually also put for, it's also a pre vendors uh, case. And when we're talking about that, of course, we're also preparing for next investment round. So what kind of data do we have to show new investors? The external view, but also the day-to-day internal view and are we actually doing the right thing. And if I say one thing that is clear to me then when working with a number of startups that is that it's a big difference in late stage versus early stage, right? Because the early stage, honestly people don't, or startups don't really have any data, right? You come there and I also teach the CBS and people come to me with, I have this idea, great. And of course, you can have some kind of data, but that is basically external market research. I don't know about you, but I don't really put any value on that, right? You know, I can dream up any big market. Just, you know, well, it's a hot dog stand or whatever, I can tell it about this billion dollar market and I can make a hockey stick. So honestly, what is important in the early days, that is your vision and dream and your team. But, you know, if I should take the template thing, right? It's out here, then, I'm 100% sure that it's all about data, right? Well, of course, you have to sort of like the management team and believe they can grow further, but it's all about the data you have. So one of the big mistakes I see is that people try to focus on the wrong data because they are, uh, you know, I, I'll see some slide decks from companies raising $100 million, and they're basically two, star, uh, two persons in a, in a basement try to out f uh, figure out some basic stuff they should use other metrics than late stage. So what are the three different phases I see? And, and of course, the first one is, you know, you meet these, this young startup and they say, I have an idea. And what's your next, <laughs> your next question? That is, well, is it only in your head or do other people have it? So in the initial phase is that that's basically where I most invest. That is something that there is some interest. And what could interest be? That could be, you know, the classic, we do a fake, fake website, something like that. 
It could be a lot of intense if you're in the business to business. But basically, it's very, very soft. But that's honestly what you can get in the beginning, right? It's like you don't have any revenue. If you haven't built the, the product yet, you most likely have, don't have real users. What do you have? But, but that you ca can't get that far with, right? So you quickly end in phase two, you know, when you most likely raise money, maybe not from your uncle, but actually for some external people that don't trust you that much. And this is actually one I stole from Katrine, because that's a classic cohort, cohort analysis, right? So if you're doing <coughs> anything from the SME or consumer perspective, you know, the classic strategy is not to chart that much from in the beginning. But if you don't have revenue, what do you then have to show? You have to show that the customers love the product. And on the other hand, you have like enterprise sales, right? The good thing about B2B in the enterprise segment that is that if you can really solve a problem, then you can actually charge money. So I invest a lot in, 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 in enterprise software. And the good thing is that you, know, you can have even a small team going out to a company of course, it's not all companies that are willing to pay initially. But if you can't get a single customer to become a paying customer, in, even in this early phase, I think you have other problems. You know, you know, because you need to go out and get the first invoice sent. So this is like the medium uh, middle stage. And the difference I see between one and two could best be um, symbolized by a Kickstarter, right? Has anyone you tried to, to do a Kickstarter campaign? Not a single one? It's damn hard, right? It's damn hard to run a Kickstarter campaign successfully because you have to convince people up front that you have something amazing. But there's also a big difference between doing a successful Kickstarter campaign and actually delivering on that product, right? Just as some of the recent examples we had here in Denmark, right? We know, how many, how many of you have heard about this electric bicycle case? Right? How many of you consider buying one of those? You know, it's, it's really, really, there's a big difference between selling a dream and delivering on that. And I, basically, that's what I see the difference between one and two. You know, selling the dream, delivering on the dream. But then you come to the third phase, right? And that is, you can say, most likely the phase, what you can call the simplify phase here, because if you raise, like, or order yo-yo, that's a series A, or a simplify, well, you need to have all these figures in place, right? You need all, not only those two, but all these figures where you document a big need. So if I just sum it up, that is that you really have to focus on where are you right now and what do you have to document. So if you're in the early days, you know, for me, it's still a lot of the team and go out and document a little bit of customer interest, get the small sum of money you can get to proceed and ideally, of course, you can fund it yourself, but you know, you're not out raising a bit round, but it changed a lot as we go. So, you know, I'm a private investor. Uh, so I see a lot of cases like pre seed also. Uh, and I think this, where you're chasing the wrong metrics and chasing metrics and trying to communicate metrics just simply don't add any value. You know, I don't know how many uh, startups I've seen who said, oh my God, we got 2,000 downloads in the first week. Uh, great. Then I asked them, how many of these are using it now? Or even in a cohort analysis. Um, it's not my, uh, I actually stole that from Crazy Egg, but that's another story. Um, but again, finding a lot of metrics that doesn't add business value. I think that is the biggest mistake you should have, or you should, you should, you should avoid. That is to say, okay, does it, is it really a sign that we're on the right track? And I'll say, give me any product and I can give you 10,000 downloads. 10,000 downloads is actually relatively cheap, right? So it's about how you got those 10,000 downloads and what they resulted in. And if you're in the e-commerce business or whatever, you know, yeah, it's not about your your, your number of sales, though it's about you know, what kind of value can we get out of the customers, et cetera, et cetera. It sounds simple, but I see that mistake again and again. So if I should wrap up this, I'll say, you know, it's really about the different stages you're in. Um, 
And remember that it's not only for the external perspective, it's also for the internal one. That's actually why I also uh, ask Jonas to, uh, to come today because I'm an investor in the company. And I just see that the way, you know, I, when I'm sitting in these board meetings, I think that's the right way because he, he's giving a very open, uh, open view on what's going well and not so well and how they work with that on a daily basis. But this is what, just what I say. So how to do it in real life? I think that's the most important thing here. So we have Jakob Egelund coming and give a view on how it actually is to do that. And the reason why I know Jakob from, because he was a pain in the ass for a long time, right? Because I've created a company uh, that's called Peneo, together with someone else, and we have uh, Jakob on the board. And Jakob was Mr. Metric who's trying to say all the time, yeah, show us these data. It's a bit annoying, but he was right. And now it's good to see he's on the other side where he's actually have to produce the data. And I guess he has to respond to irritating inv investors as well. So, Jakob, welcome. Thank you. Thank you.